Welcome to Martial Wisdom. Here you can listen to conversations on all kinds of topics related to martial arts. In today's topic, we're going to have a conversation about the art of self-protection. Joining me in this discussion is Oliver Martinez and Dan Trelescu. Before we get started, please consider supporting this podcast by liking and sharing it. I'm also thrilled to announce that our Spirit Aikido online program now has over 215 videos. In some of the more recent videos, I cover defenses for headlocks and guillotines and ways to work these into your live training with Aikido. Another option is to contribute any amount you like through the PayPal tip jar. Even small contributions are greatly appreciated. I hope you enjoy this episode. Now, on with the discussion. Uh, welcome to the podcast. I'm eager to get into this great topic with uh, my friend Oliver uh, and Dan Trelescu. Uh, Oliver Martinez uh, and I go way back. Uh, we, he and I met many years ago and have trained together a number of times. Uh, he's down in Dallas. Um, and Dan Trelescu, I've had on the podcast before, and we've had a great discussion uh, previously. So we want to get into talking about the art of self-protection and how this is different than the art of self-defense. Now, I will grant you this is just a a classification of these two that it makes sense in my mind. I've had other instructors that think very much the same way, and that is that this that self defense often covers the physical side of what of an exchange or or a a, a hostile conflict, whereas the art of self protection are, are all the skills that lead up to that point that can help you be aware of danger, help you avoid it help you uh, sort of manipulate your situation so that you don't have to get into a physical exchange and that the art of self-defense is what happens when your self-protection arts break down, they fail um, or, or what have you. So uh, I think to get started, I'd like to just have each person, each of us go over a little bit of, of our experience with self-protection, the study and our interest in it. Um, for myself, I, I realized that studying martial arts is not enough to keep myself safe. And so for my lifetime, I've also pursued how do you build awareness? What are the soft skills that are needed in order to frame that martial art rather than just say, well, I'm going to be a really great martial artist and that's going to cover me. Um, so that was my interest. Uh, Oliver, maybe you can go next with that. Yeah. So um, I'm lifelong martial artist, Aikido primarily. Um I worked briefly in private security and I'm in a leadership role on our security team at our local church. So the idea of having those soft skills, because we're working with people, you need to have people skills. So that study is super important to, at our school, at our dojo, we try to dive as deep into that as we can with the understanding that people are there to learn a martial art and not necessarily hear me yap about, you know, people skills, but we do note that there's uh, an integration that needs to happen if you're going to be a holistic martial artist. So uh, that study is, is definitely embedded in our, our DNA. So. Outstanding. Dan. Yeah. So uh, somewhat similar with me, I've been doing Aikido for about 15 years now. Um, at some point I started, I read a lot. So I started getting into reading a lot, reading about martial arts, real violence, and realizing that there is a bit of a difference between what we do in class and maybe what covers the whole spectrum of what you might need to keep yourself safe. Um, So once the discrepancy was noticed, I had to do something about it. So I started doing more training specifically for that. So I've been training with Rory Miller, Chiron training, violence dynamics, those groups for about the last 10 years. And at some point I started teaching and I realized I had responsibility to students if they showed up and they were expecting to learn to keep themselves safe as well as martial arts, then that needed to be either addressed in class or I had to say, we don't do that here. And I personally didn't want to do that. So we had to start bringing that more into training. Um, So that's been very much a focus for the last decade. And um, now I I do mostly, I teach just self-protection skills, um, particularly during the current times, Mm -hmm. focusing on the soft skills because, you know, hard to do physical skills online. And um, I also have, I did a degree in counseling studies during which I focused my research on the psychological aspects of self-defense instruction. So that's also part of where my interest comes from and looking at the academic research around the subject, limited as it is. You studied self-defense like academically? I didn't know this about you. Tell me about that. 
like it doesn't exist as an academic study mostly because there isn't exactly funding for it but i studied a subject that gave me the opportunity at a university where they gave me the opportunity to tailor my specific research project that i had to do for my degree in this direction mm. and kind of doing stuff around it with um sports psychology and with uh, counseling and mental health which are all related to it so somehow made it work That's super cool yeah that is great that's really cool uh, and I think that what Oliver touched on and, and, and Dan as well is that these arts are integrated. They are not entirely separate. Although you can develop your practice and your skills, at, the soft skills of self-protection and be really good at them. And they could applied properly and done correctly can completely avoid the, the need for physical fighting or, or a physical exchange. Um, and I'm not certain if the reverse is true. Uh, whereas somebody who becomes like a really prominent uh, or very strong fighter, he can get himself in so much trouble by not having awareness, not making good decisions or, or putting himself in, into, into harm's way that despite his skill, he cannot save himself from. Um, and with, with all kinds of violence, not even you know, the gunfire and things like that, but just being overwhelmed, you know, getting into a situation where he's got too many people that overwhelm him or even somebody that just gets a good shot in, knocks him cold and, you know, can take his life. Um, but so there is, I think, a, a, that integrative, that context is one thing. Um, and I like the way Oliver described that of, of you know, the, the integrating together, because when you do study a physical art, a martial art, it won't just stand on its own for a complete person to use for self-defense or, or I should say for self-protection. Um, they need to have the awareness that of where that the physical art fits in. It's not going to be their, their one and only answer. Uh, do you guys remember the light bulb moment for y'all? I mean, do you, do, do you guys remember like, Oh, this, I'm not studying the entire package here. Like, was it a, a personal experience? Was it something that you read? Like, what, what was it for you guys? So I don't remember what it was for me personally. I remember what it was when teaching. Because I, I was, um, I don't remember if this was after I was already like the teacher at the dojo or just teaching some of the classes, but we're doing Ikkyo. And one of the students was a 13 year old girl. And I, you know, we were showing them the technique and they were all doing it and they were doing it fine. And I'm looking at this and she's practicing with like an adult man, six foot guy who's done multiple martial arts and I'm go going to think to myself, so I'm teaching her that if this guy or someone like him attacks her, what she's supposed to do is take him down and sit on him. This is, this is completely wrong. Like she needs her 60 pounds to hold him down, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's just tactically, it's not smart. And so that was like, okay, we're going to change this now to turning this into a technique to facilitate escape, you know, just so that you have an alternative thing and we're going to drill that. And I think there were light bulb moments before that for me personally, but that was that was a big one for the teaching side. Did that happen instantaneous? Like right then and there, did you go, like, all right, we're going to change this drill? Or was that maybe a week or two later? You're like, no, no that was like immediately. Like that was immediately we're changing the drill. Yeah. And for me, uh, because I studied uh, firearm training and stuff, I started my teens. I never really had a single light bulb moment, but there was one as we were starting to cover uh, learning more about the handgun and, and self-defense with handgun to realize there are si many situations, in fact, the vast majority of violent conflicts that do not warrant the use of the, uh, lethal force. So using a firearm is not justified legally or morally. And, but to say then, okay, how do you frame the fact if you do carry a firearm that you are really only prepared for about 5% of, of violent encounters? to use it. Okay. So what do you do for the other 90%? What do you do when, uh, you know, you have, you have something where you just cannot bring your gun out and shoot somebody. And this is, I just want to bring this up as one of my most frustrating, uh, BS advice that I've heard from, even from Aikido people that will say, Aikido is not meant for defending yourself. If you want to defend yourself, just go get a gun. And I want to slap these people in the head because it's the, some of the dumbest advice I think I've ever heard. And that is uh, because it reflects a very poor level of understanding of self-defense, self-protection, firearms, 
martial arts, pretty much everything. It's like they might as well have idiot tattooed on their on their forehead when they say stuff like that. Yeah, it's um, certainly a narrow. Uh, to be kind, it's certainly a narrow view of the of the situation or of right. the, it's, it's, the problem that we're trying to solve. It's right, such a bad caricature that it is. Not, it, it's beyond even a reference to reality. Um, it's also very just America centric or countries where you can legally. There's have a that. There's that really too. Better. Yeah. Wait. So yeah. wait. There's places you guys can't get guns. I've, I'm in Texas. So is that yeah. is that <laughs> right. normal? Like the rest of the world can't. Yep. No, 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 not around here. I mean, you can, but there's a lot of hoops to jump through and it's practically impossible unless you have a really good reason. So for our listeners, Dan, where are you located? In Germany, Germany. Oh, okay, Germany, right. Um, so yeah, the, the, the light bulb moment you were asking about, I was always interested in context because as you study martial arts from a hand-to-hand uh, or empty hand uh, aspect and then knife wielding, firearm wielding, you have to cover context because they are vastly different. And one of my other frustrations was how many uh, people that were in the firearms community that completely dismissed the idea of practicing any empty hand skills whatsoever. And, you know, I I always thought back to the the old original Conan movies, like, okay, what is, what is the sword without the hand that wields it? Like that, the, the hand is the power, the body is the, the skill. And, you know, from a simple practical standpoint, if you're no good with your hands, how in the world are you going to wield a firearm skillfully? Like you need to have a lot of other skills. And that was the context part. You know, if you can, if you're skilled at balance, understanding, uh, you know, physical movements and, and how bodies move in relation to one another, adding a knife, adding a firearm into the mix is kind of a small thing. But if you have no idea of any of that stuff and you introduce a knife or a firearm into it, now you're asking for pure chaos. Um, you know, the body discipline is what allows the control of the weapon. Um, and so I guess with that context, I also learned, and this is where I would, I would say counting the art of self-protection, you could also say it's the art of security. The idea that, for example, let's say <clears throat> you live in a neighborhood and you hear that there are break-ins going in on around in your neighborhood. And you, the first thought is, I'm going to go get a gun. I'm going to go buy a shotgun. I'm going to go buy, you know, because you're in America or what, you know, mm-hmm. that's just your first thought. Do you think, how about I put in an alarm system? How about I put in lights around my property? How about I put in heavy duty uh, locks on my doors or bars on my windows? Like, what are the other things you can do other than just go, to what some lay person would probably think of right away to protect themselves, stop the problem be- before it gets inside your house and, and go after the security part, the, the context of what is going to make you and your family more secure. Let's see. When I was coming up and I'm, I'm you know, I don't want to speak for you guys because I don't know what your experience was like, but when I was coming up, the feeling was, well, martial arts and self-defense were synonymous terms. Like, if, mm-hmm. you know, Oh, he knows self-defense, you know, cause he does, martial arts or there was no distinction at all and uh it's naive of me but i i feel sometimes like it's uh given now that everyone gets that self-defense is a multi-layered solution to a very complex problem and then you get online you realize like that is absolutely not true (laughs) like nothing no we've made very little advancements in that understanding Mm -hmm. now what i will say is there's more information out so there's less excuse not to know because there's really, really good information out there now. Um, but, you know, like like Tristan said, you know, you'll be on a forum. The conversation will steer towards self-defense or self-protection. And you're still getting those very myopic views of like, well, you have a very complex problem. Here's a very simple solution and it'll take care of all of it. And, and you know, I know the three of us here, we, we don't buy that. We don't believe that, right. you know. Well, and the, the real gem of what you just said was that security is, a, is a, about a comp, solving a complex problem. And this is something that, that I learned with my exposure to the security field, because I was always curious about it. And I wanted to know more. If you hired, for example, a bodyguard and you said, okay, I want you to protect me. The first question he would say is from what? What's the threat? What are you trying to protect exactly? Where are you going to be? What are the threats that that you are suspecting because that is what will form the plan for the security that you want to do or that you want to have 
to say, I just want you to protect me from everything in the world. They're going to go, well, <laughs> sorry, but you know, we can't form a yeah. plan based on, yeah. you know, are you, have you got gang problems? Are you somebody trying to assassinate you? Is somebody trying to break into your house, cat burglars trying to break into your house and steal bonds you have locked up in a safe or what, what is the threat we need to, mm-hmm. we need to worry about, you know, we need to use that as our focus for what we're going to try to form our, your security plan on. Um, I think that's a really important point because one of the big differences sort of in, in the like meta, how you think about it, things with martial arts is um, if it's just about the martial art, it can be a particular system that is passed down and preserved mm-hmm. and it can be adapted somewhat to the individual students, but it's still that system that completely doesn't really work, doesn't work with self-protection because different people will have radically different actual safety risks and different needs for them. Mm-hmm. And you can't just pass down one system of solutions or tools. It, it just doesn't work that way because it will be really different for lots of people. Sure. You know, depending on demographics, depending on where you live, depending on your background, it, is just, it, it has to be about the student. It can't be about the system. That's right. an awesome point because I know when, and I, I think we've, I mean, we've all talked to, to Ian Abernathy at, at, at some point, either in podcast form or over coffee or something like that. And, um, you know, one of the things I'm always blown away talking to him about is self-defense law in the UK, because it is very, very different than the self-defense law in the U S and, you know, once you start looking at the, the legal implications, like you realize if somebody says, um, you know, X martial art is best for self-defense, you know, like self-defense where, right. Mm-hmm. In the UK or the U S or Texas or Florida or, you know, Wisconsin, because those are all going to be very different solutions to to the problems that you might face. And so, you know, I'm wondering, Dan, you know, in 100 years, the systems that we're passing down are regional, not based on tactics, but like on legalities, you know, oh, we couldn't do that there, you know, versus, oh, yeah, we have. Um, last time we were talking to Ian, he mentioned maybe, you know, glassing. Do you know what glassing is? Yeah. Dan? OK, yeah, I've never heard funny. that term yeah. in my whole life. You know, have you heard that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not. Go ahead and describe it. Just okay, so he said it. And I was not, like, not, "What are you with. talking about?" He's like, "Oh yeah, it's like a you take a glass and you hit someone over the head with it." I'm like, "Oh yeah." Where do you hang out? Like, what, <laughs> why is that a, a factor that you need to worry about? But like, we have like in our dojo and and you know Dallas Fort Worth area, we don't have an anti-glassing self-defense technique. I did not know that was a problem, uh, but Ian does. You know, I bet Dan does now. So that's like a really good point that just regionally self-defense is going to look differently. And I bet you the self-protection, the soft skills, the way you talk to somebody in one region is not going to be the same way that you talk to them somewhere else. Mm-hmm. I mean, for simple things, it's uh, since you mentioned Ian in the UK, you know, um, if you live in certain cities in the UK, which soccer club shirt or football, like we call it properly, shirt you wear to which area, which pub is a big part of self-protection potentially. Mm-hmm. You know, other places there's not something you have to worry about, but that's that might be something that could put you on the risk on a risk list. You know, just in a small region, like just in a, a little well, area yeah, that we might like, not know about. Cities that have two rival teams, and like Glasgow, rival teams and huge violence. You know, and I think they've actually banned the wearing of uh, football club shirts from pubs oh, no because kidding. of too many stabbings. You know, so yeah. it's you know that that sort of thing. This is something like there is specific stuff depending on the region, both in terms of legalities, in terms of culture that if you live there, you just need to know for your safety and they're going to be very different to what somewhere, someone, someone somewhere else needs. Mm-hmm. Right. You know, and this is where I always come back to the, the wise words of Sun Tzu that said, you know, know your enemy and know yourself and in a hundred battles, you won't be in peril. And I think from a security standpoint, knowing where you're going to go, basically what a place is, is going to be like or what a neighborhood or an area is going to be like, um, and forming a plan of how, of how you're going to navigate it and pr- prepare yourself in advance and, and to navigate it to not put yourself in, in undue uh, jeopardy is, is a wise thing. And I think one of, the, one of the best pieces of advice ever is to be very careful going where young men are drinking alcohol. Like if there was one top of the list, the top of the top 10 list at pieces of advice, that would be one of them, whether it's frat parties, um, nightclubs and bars, uh, what have you, as soon as there's young men drinking alcohol, the, the chances of violence 
go go up uh, and they go up drastically. And then the second piece of advice is when you're in such a place, be careful about drinking alcohol yourself because your own awareness and your own observation and your re reactions and your judgment start to decline. And so, you know, in, personally for me, uh, I have to trust the, the company that I'm in before I'm, I'm comfortable taking a drink. Um, if I'm out with, with strangers and, you know, what have you, just for those two reasons, uh, I, that's just something I, I avoid doing because um, you never know. And I've seen things spark from what appears to be absolutely nothing. And, you know, if you're, if you're distorted, your balance is, is off, your, your judgment's off, your timing's off because your brain isn't working correctly. Uh, these can be, you know, failures of the art of self-protection. All right. I'm going to put you guys on the spot. All, All right. right. Lay it on. Top three factors or pieces of advice for, for building a self-protection plan. You've got somebody comes to you. They've never done anything. What do you guys do? What's your top three thing? Just off, I, I won't hold you to it. Cause you'll probably come up with a better thing like a week from now, but for today, if you had to answer, what would be like your top, top two or three things, Dan, what do you, what do you think? I'm really glad you said that thing because this usually happens like to ask a question and the next day you have the better answer. Yeah. Okay. So I, I don't, Okay, I'm going to just make something up for top three. I don't have a top three because it depends on the person. First one is, um, we'll go over what relationship red flags are because so much violence happens with in relationships. And I don't mean just romantic relationships. Yeah. I mean, friendships at work, like people that you know, like most bad shit happens with people. By the way, Tristan, is it okay to swear on this? Yes, go ahead. Speak your mind. Okay, cool. Most bad shit happens with people that you know. So um, this is one of the things that we'll go over. So, you know, the, the basic red flags are, do the people accelerate the relationship too fast? You know, someone want to be buddy buddies immediately. Are you being asked to do stuff at work that you should not be doing at this stage? Uh, is someone getting intimate with you faster than you're comfortable? Do they cut you off from your support network and other resources? And do they ignore your boundaries? And the last one, which this, this came up, you know, funny story, because I was, I used to teach this three big ones. And then at the seminar, some, I asked, you know, people, what are the red flags? And someone said violence. And I was like, well, no, it's supposed to be about violence. And I was like, well, actually, yes. Yes. Someone being violent <laughs> in a relationship is a red flag. So that is a red flag. You yeah. should probably pay attention to that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that would be like, that would be one of the top three for sure, because that's, you can head off so much stuff just by not getting into relationships that are problematic or at least being aware of which of your relationships are potentially risky. Um, uh, let's see. Second one. <laughs> um, so this one is particularly if it's a dude, it's, it's okay to walk away. Like you do not need to win every exchange, whatever win means, like it's okay to leave. And that's something that, that would be one of the biggest pieces for security advice is like, it's not always appropriate, but there's lots of situations where it's all right to just walk away. You know, and that's almost exclusively men where that has to yeah, be like, sure. it's, it's a, like, it's, it's a thing. Um, and the last one, and this isn't directly, but this is tied into like one of the big things that gets missed out is how to make decisions about um, personal protection. And so one of the big things that I would do is like value-based decision-making because uh, Tristan, you were saying, you know, quite correctly that places where young men consume alcohol are a big risk. Mm -hmm. But here's the thing, a lot of people that come to us, I teach a lot of college students, they, they're going to go to these places. This oh, is yeah. not something that, that, you know, just coming in and saying, well, don't do that doesn't really work. And I see too many, there's too many instructors in the self-defense sphere who kind of come in and just say, do this, don't do this. It's like, that might not work with the values of the lifestyle of the particular student. So going over how do you do a risk assessment? How do you, what are your personal values and how do you make your self-defense, your self-protection uh, choices based on those values and the risks? So I think those are like my top three right now. All right. And we'll check on Listen. you next week. With yes, right. Yeah, check on me okay. next week. Drop back. Yeah, exactly. With, with the good list. All right. What, what about yeah. you, Tristan? I'm, you glad you, I'm glad, Dan, you, you mentioned the, that typical response of, well, just don't go where, where young men are drinking alcohol. Like you, you can't just live like a monk or a nun and stay home in your basement and live in fear. 
Um, that's kind of a personal hot button for me. And we're living in an age right now where fear has gripped everybody to the point of, you know, many people are just so terrified they can't even step outside their house. Um, and I just, that's personally, I just, I believe the fear is worse than the actual thing almost all the time, uh, because it will cripple you. It will cripple your brain. It will, it will make you depressed and angry. Um, it's, it's just bad news. So my top three would be the first one. I would say to the person you've already taken the first step, which is to take responsibility. You have said, this is not somebody else's problem. This is my problem to fix. And, and, that's the first step into the wider path. But ultimately, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, whatever decision you're going to make, ultimately, it is your responsibility to make a good decision. Um, never expect anybody else to help you. Never expect that you're kind of along for the ride. It is your choices and actions that are going to determine your fate. Um, and this, that would be number one. Uh, and that applies all the time. Absolutely count on yourself because you will be there. Uh, the second one would be uh, trust your instincts, use your instincts. Uh, the, one of the most common things for people that have survived violence is to say things like, uh, and this relates to the, you know, 80% of victims, uh, the, the perpetrator was somebody that they knew, that they met, that they knew either they met them a week ago or they've known them for six months, a year. Maybe they were family, maybe they're friends, something like that. <clears throat> and a lot of times these victims say, I just, I couldn't, I couldn't even believe what was happening. I didn't expect it. I didn't, you know, something felt wrong, but I, I thought maybe I was crazy. And I just ignored those instincts. I said, no, my logical brain shut that off and said, you know, no, they're not really a bad person or, or I'm getting the EBGVs from them, but I, I must be crazy. It's just, some, and they ignore it. And then something bad happens. Um, inevitably, when, as people look back and myself included, when I've had a bad instinct about somebody, 99% of the time it was right. There was something that was beyond what I could put my finger on, but later it turned out to be that they were some kind of scumbag or, you know, they did some detestable thing. Um, there's a great book that I'm going to, that I've mentioned on this podcast before. Uh, yeah, it, it, it's the, um, can we guess it? Can guess I guess it? it? Is Go it going to be Gavin DeBecker? Yep. That's the one, All the right. gift of fear. Um, our instincts are there that go back, you know, millennia to protect us and to deny them just because you think, you know, you're, you're crazy or something like that. Definitely check out that book. It will open your eyes to using your instincts. Um, and the third one I'll say, which is just use your head, think, think through your problem. And, and that is required to do that. You need to keep a cool head. Don't let yourself panic. Don't let yourself become uh, erratic or, or um, jumpy or make hasty decisions. Think it through. If you, if you have those soft skills where you're noticing things that something's going awry, your instincts are telling you, hey, something's going wrong here. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to add something that, that I did learn uh, firsthand many years ago, which was asking myself, do I really need to be in this room right now? And if you honestly answer, no, I don't need to be here, get out. Uh, and this was at a party when I first moved to the Texas the very first time. I was kind of wanting to socialize and get out with people, and, and, but I didn't really know very many. And I, I met through a mutual friend down there, a group that were having a party over at their house. And so I go over and, you know, house full of people and, you know, they're drinking some beers and having a good time. I don't know anybody other than one person at this whole party. And, you know, I'm there maybe 45 minutes and this guy pulls a pistol out of his back pocket says, Oh, Hey, check this out. And I looked at it and, you know, I, I just started doing some math in my head. Okay. People have been drinking. We're in a house. We're not at a range. He pulled this thing out of his back pocket and is now basically kind of waving it around. He didn't clear the, he didn't empty it and clear the, the, the chamber. So I'm assuming it's loaded. I'm like, do I really need to be in this room right now? Not that I thought he was going to go all yeehaw and start shooting the place up, but somebody who's, who's had a few beers, their coordination's maybe not so good. The thing was a pretty small gun. Whether it was small or not, doesn't really matter. He drops it, it goes off. Where does that bullet go? Do I really need to be here and be, you know, with the ante on the table of perhaps getting 
shot, and I would say accidentally would be more than on purpose because there was no conflict going on there. I just thought, you know, uh, I think I've gotten about as much fun out of this party as I really need to at this point. Um, of course, I come from a place where if you go shooting, you put the guns away, then you bring the beer out. That just kind of made sense to me. And, and maybe I was, you know, in a different, little different culture, but I just thought the risk wasn't worth it. And it was time to, you know, bid good night to everybody. Now, I'm not saying that that is some kind of morally or, or security minded s- superior attitude to have, but in terms of just general risk, it seemed like a better choice than to hang around and with a bunch of people I'd never met before, had no idea where this was going to go. Uh, Cause I've been at parties where things have gotten a bit off the rails um, just, and I don't know the people and what to expect. So at very least, had I stayed there, I would not have been comfortable and I would probably never have touched another beer or, or had a, had a drink just cause I'm like, I don't know what's going on here. So the question, do I really need to be in this room right now? Um, if the answer is no, then maybe leaving is a good, a good option. It's always that kind of, real, reality check for that's your boundary. Much. That's your, uh, yeah. your, your go, your action word for yourself or your action phrase for yourself. Yeah. And if, if it's yes, you ask yourself, is it my pride or my ego that's keeping me in this room versus I'm here to protect, you know, a family member or some, a loved one or something like that, which can happen. I mean, you can be in places where that answer is not, no, I can't mm-hmm. leave either because your, your uh, exit is being blocked or, there's something else that you have to be there to do. You have to protect something, you know, like a bouncer can't say I can just run away because your job is to provide security to that club. The same way, for example, an owner of a house is this is my home. It's a party at my house. I can't just leave. If somebody's bringing, you know, violence or potential harm to my home, I have to be here for, for that. I have to put a stop to it. Um, And I guess this brings me on the second thing that frustrates me with, uh, martial artists and, and a lot of, a lot, a lot of them, <clears throat> pardon me, uh, Aikidos in general will often say, well, just run away. If you're faced with violence, just run away. It's almost like you're assuming a couple of big things. One is you can run away. Second is you can actually get away as opposed to being chased down and, and eventually beaten. Um, and that it's always going to save yourself and not potentially leave other people to be victimized. Um, And this is kind of like the just go get a gun, also a a false caricature. And not to say that everybody should turn themselves into some kind of vigilante where if you're faced with physical violence, then you have to go fight. You don't. But you can't also say that you should just always run away. You know, there's judgment there on what which one is appropriate. Yes, it's like Ian is our uh, our imaginary fourth guest here because I'm going to I'm going to channel him, too, because last conversation we had he talked about escape skills and Mm -hmm. running away is in that category but there's other things like where are you running to Mm -hmm. um how you know what what are the exits like that's an escape skill like if i just turn around and just start run you guys uh, you probably haven't seen it dan but you might have uh tristan a couple years back uh this dude was causing havoc at a gas station and the gas station actually had a security officer there which means it's probably kind of a crummy gas station right and uh he he pepper sprays this guy and the guy turns and just takes off but because he can't see he like wily coyotes into the side of the station and (laughs) he's out i mean he's completely out but i mean that illustrates the point right like you can't just run away like that guy tried to just run away it didn't work out so great for him so you know you have to run to something you know Mm -hmm. Um, and i just saw just a few days ago uh a video it was a surveillance footage of, of two guys. I think they were in like a, a parking lot of a convenience store or something. They were squaring off and fighting. And one guy was kept backing up and backing up and backing up. And then he turns and he takes off and runs right into the street and gets hit by a car. So not to say that when you, you run, you still need your awareness when you're running. You have to look around for what you're running into, whether it's the, the side of the convenience store or into, into traffic. Um, but, you know, it brings up other questions too, even if without the traffic and you run somewhere firstly what if somebody chases you and they follow you are you and whether you get cornered or just exhausted or they catch you you have to assume if you're going to get away that you're going to run faster than they 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 do and that you do succeed in getting away and this is where 
you know, as, as people who study in art that they claim that running away is their primary, uh, I guess, is that their strategy. Choice. Yeah. Well, how, how often do you practice running? How often, you know, wouldn't you be a parkourist? I mean, cause as I understand parkour mm -hmm. is pretty much the art of being able to run faster than anybody else and cover obstacles better than anybody else. Like, so that yeah. if, if any art lived up to the just run away mantra, it would be parkour. Which is a whole set of skills, right? It is. It's, it's an it's... entire, it's a system. It's a system of escape. Right. And I can guarantee you, like, most of the people that, that use that term do not have a grab bag of escape skills. You know, <laughs> they, they just don't, right? Right. So, right. I mean, it, it's, it's one of those, like, the, the word just for anything in self-protection is should be a giant red flag mm -hmm. like just run away or and you know there's if, if you claim that running away is your primary tactic then you need to devote some time to training it like you both of you were saying there's a skill sets with it and it's part of it is you know where do you go right and usually what you know what we tell people is lights and people right like you want to go where there's lights and where there's people but that also might be region specific and it's not just this, it's also, it's not as simple as just turning around and taking off while someone is trying to attack you. You might have to use a physical response first that puts them in a position where you can more easily escape, depending on, that will differ depending on what martial art you do. I know, and in our imaginary fourth Ian, you know, mm -hmm. they have lots of stuff for hitting people really hard and then running away, mm -hmm. which works for them. Uh, we had lots of stuff for like, essentially of balancing them and running away. Mm -hmm. which could also work for what we do um which actually brings me to something i want to throw to both of you which is the idea of integrating these skills with your martial art because particularly the physical parts of self-protection which there are some there are also soft skills they can be tied into martial arts so one thing that uh, i really like doing is with aikido we have all these ukemi skills we practice falling mm -hmm. how many dojos actually practice running away or getting into a sprint from a breakfall which right. is a very valuable skill because you don't want to stay on the ground. And if your primary tactic, as you say, is to run away after someone has put you on the ground might be a good time for that. So I was wondering what have you guys seen done well and maybe not done so well with these skills with integrating them into the martial arts practice and what do you do yourself? Oh, that's a good question. You know, uh, this, the way that you pose that, I, I really like it for one thing and the fact that if you get thrown and you get to the ground, you have to get back up and run. I'd not actually considered that part before because I, as I thought about it, if you're on the ground and you've got somebody who's standing there, getting up and running, you seem to have another problem to deal with before you actually get back to your feet, which is a standing attacker who's just thrown you. So but what I have done with training, which is we reverse it. You throw somebody down how many times in Aikido, for example, do we practice, you throw somebody and now you close in on them and you pin them. So now you are engaging with them on the ground. You're assuming one, that they don't respond or you have thrown them so effectively that they can't respond and you get into a pin position. But what you're building is reinforcing the idea of you get somebody to the ground and now you go down there and join them in a pin. Instead, what I will often do is have a throw and now you take off. There's your opportunity to get somebody on the ground. You've just bought time because most people don't get up off the ground very quickly to let you cover ground as you leave. Um, so that's how I've, I've integrated into, into the training part for don't build the habit of al always engaging in a pin. Um, and I've always also removed almost all of the kneeling pins uh, because I find that they, they tend to be rather unreliable against highly active aggressive uh people and i'm not fond of kneeling on the ground as a reflex i'd rather have i'd rather be standing or kneeling on uke for for the pin itself but the choice of whether to pin or not should not be a default of yes i'm going to pin it should be just throw and take off or drop somebody and take off that should be as strong of, a, of an instinct as is controlling somebody on the ground i guess that'd be my my answer to that Pre-pandemic, uh, we had um, we would do once a month something called street clothes night, where we we would come in just what we would be wearing mm -hmm. normally, and we would still do uh, aikido application, but we would throw 
kind of monkey wrenches into it. So we would do something like uh, building narrow corridors so that the Tencon had to be really tight now. You couldn't do full Tino Hinko type stuff. Um, but to specifically what you're talking about, we would do uh, like Giawaza or Rondori, the multiple attacker. But like once you had the opening, we would we'd designate um, if you could get off that map, you know, go off that map side, you were safe. So then the run, you know, we'd go, all right, Ajme, you should start moving. And your job was to run Dory your way to that. And that, that worked pretty well. Like it was good. It was, uh, it broke the pattern of uh, bringing somebody down, penning, um, that, that type of thing. But what we have not been historically great at, ironically, I'm better at it with my like private lesson clients than I am with the, the actual class is things that would prevent you from getting in that Rondori in the first place. Mm. They're just really awkward to train because I find that most martial artists, at least in my experience, are really horrible role players, uh, myself Everybody. included, right? I'm an awful role player, you know? Like I, so I can't even feed you the stimulus that you would need to, to de-escalate it or anything like that. Plus, you know, I, when people are coming to your Aikido dojo or your karate dojo or your jujitsu gym, they might say they want self-defense or self-protection, but they don't want to be lectured for an hour mm -hmm. on adrenal response and uh, violence dynamic. Like that's not what they're paying you for. Pre-fight cues. Pre-fight cues. Like that's just, they, they, they think they are, but then I, I just, I sense, and maybe I'm wrong on this. Uh, you know, maybe, maybe this isn't the right thinking. I feel like nobody would come back if you spent half the time doing those things and then the other half. So, uh, you know, again, historically, we're just not great at it. I don't know what's best. I don't know, maybe a seminar format. Like I said, my private clients get it better because we'll say, um, okay, we're going to talk about baseline concept today. You walk into a local supermarket. What should the baseline be? What would you expect to see? what would be off the baseline? And we have those conversations and then I go, all right, when I see you next week, I want you to tell me a couple of things that you noticed that were off the ba baseline from where you were. And I know I don't do that with my normal students. And, and maybe it's as simple as that. It's just going like two minutes at the end of class. This is what your homework is. When I see you next week, tell me something that you saw. Um, tell me about a, a verbal altercation that you might've gone into and something that maybe it's that simple. I, I, don't, I don't know what the solution is. But once the physical conflicts happen, I think we can remix our responses a bit for us to build escaping skills and preemption skills and all that. I, I don't know that I've got a good solution to pre-conflict mm. solutions yet. Well, I'll tell you what I used to do at the dojo, which worked pretty well. Of course, this was a small dojo in a particular country and, you know, small group of people, et cetera. You know, just an anecdote, not universal solution, but uh, this actually, uh, I got this tip from Randy King, who's a self-defense instructor from Canada, um, who I've trained with a fair bit, and I asked him, and he suggested doing five to 10 minutes of theory each class. So it's not so much that people get bored, it's you still have time for the physical, but it adds up over time, and you can sprinkle, and it really makes you organize the material, like you cannot go on, you know, big rambling triads, you have to be like, okay, precise, we're going to hit this topic now. And then I would do theory classes every once in a while where it'd be like the entire class is now this. Generally, people were very excited about that. And one thing I found, particularly working with young people, teenagers and so on, is that the part they don't like is um, being lectured too much. Like if you make it an actual conversation, it's, it tends to go over better. Of course, you have the information that you're giving, but they should be included in the conversation because people are generally the experts on their lives. And I think that's one flaw that you sometimes see in the self-protection world is, you know, I slightly blame the martial arts master stereotype from like every movie in the 80s, right, where we like to be like, listen to my wisdom and your life will be improved type of thing, as opposed to, you know, making sure it's an actual conversation. Because when you think about it, these are actually really cool topics that people generally don't talk about. They don't have another place to have a conversation about them or be included in them. So that, for me, that works pretty well or used to work pretty well. I don't know. It's, it's one possibility. It's I think you're right, Dan, because I, when I would do like self-defense workshops, I started moving away from like, here's top 10 tips for like protecting yourself or whatever. And what I, what I did was I started moving into breakout sessions 
where I go like, uh, okay, you're, and I'm using, uh, you know, Rory Miller's violence dynamic breakdown, which I know you're way more familiar with than I am, but I'd say, okay, this group over here, you're, you're criminals, you plan a resource crime and you guys over there, you create a process crime and you've got 10 minutes and then we'd bring them all back. And what we found was most of them kind of understood this stuff intuitively, but until they looked at it from the criminal's perspective, it, it didn't sink in. Like they wouldn't, because like the number one call, like I would get for private clients was, Hey, my high school student is out jogging by themselves with earbuds in late at night, you know, blaring music. So, but then you would tell that same kid, you plan a robbery and I go like, who's your victim? And they would like describe themselves, you know? And so as soon as that started to happen and it wasn't me just sitting up there going, now, you know, better, you need to do this and this and this, I think the mm -hmm. response I got was better. So I think you're, you're onto something. Just don't lecture them. Yeah. Well, that's a really good point. Cause again, I, I was doing courses on college campuses, right. And including online, and there's a lot of people in the self protection world who are like, Oh, can you still talk about this stuff on campus? You know, isn't like, is somebody going to get upset, et cetera, et cetera, because there've been all these social movements. And I haven't had a problem with this mostly because I don't go in and tell people what, what you wear, you know, don't drink alcohol. Mm -hmm. I go, what are the risk factors? If there's a topic that we have to go into, for example, you know, clothing, which, like we were talking before with the soccer shirts, it's a factor. But, and this is a really important point for if you're, if you're trying to teach this stuff, you better be able to explain why it's a factor and explain mm -hmm. it in a way that makes sense to the students, mm -hmm. right? And there, there's a phrase that I, I came across this recently in a marketing book and I absolutely love it. It's, it's my favorite thing for self-defense instruction now, which is that uh, speaking respectfully to someone's worldview is the price of entry to get their attention. Hmm. Right. So when you're when you're talking to people about it, getting them involved in the conversation, and usually like I, I don't have to tell people that getting drunk is a risk factor. I have to ask them what the risk factors are. And the first one that pops up reliably is alcohol. They know this. Mm -hmm. Exactly like you're saying. Yeah. You know, people understand this stuff, but they need you can help by kind of bringing some attention to it and how it interacts with everything else. That makes sense. That makes perfect sense. Yeah. Absolutely. One of the things that I've noticed, and I just got into a little discussion with this online just yesterday about um, an instructor who's building his student base after moving back from overseas, uh, starting a new dojo. And, you know, he felt, which I think is totally accurate, that he, in, in fulfilling students wanting to learn self-defense and self-protection, uh, which they'd kind of grouped, I guess, in one big lump thing, he felt, well, awareness is, is very important. And so he kind of wanted that to be the first lesson. And he noticed that he was concerned that students were getting bored right away. And I think that speaks to exactly what you two are both talking about of, you know, how do you describe awareness that you can't really drill it. You, you, there's, you know, what you're doing is failing to feed into the expectation of a new student who's, who's has in their mind, I need to learn some technique. And so I've found very similarly fulfill that expectation initially. What you're doing is building in layers and the, the layer of what is awareness and what is using your instinct, uh, those things will come when they suddenly have some comfort or they have built some comfort with, okay, I know what to do if things start to go mm -hmm. sideways. They, they have that, that's a big question mark that kind of needs to be addressed first. But the other thing is that, uh, and I actually use, use some drills that I came up with for introducing people to some, something like, um, like pressure. For example, if I'm standing 10 feet away from you and I take a swing at you, you know that you, there's, there's no way that I can, I can hit you. You're, you feel safe. But as I slowly start closing the distance, the pressure you feel of the danger starts to rise. And that's something. So I built a drill around that. And to, to cover the, um, what I call it, the reaction gap, the mm -hmm. fact that if I'm standing a foot from you and I twitch and slap you, there's almost no chance that you're going to block or be able to evade mm -hmm. me hitting you because I'm so close. That pressure level is as a max. You just can't respond in time. Where, whereas if you move and you make me take the long way or you keep them a distance, you put up a fence, you have, have your hands mm -hmm. up. Now you can use that to help take some of that pressure off and 
that idea starts opening up. Oh, now I need to control where I am in the space and be able to assess whether somebody coming close to me might be a threat or not. And if they are, you start to bring the hands up, you start to maneuver. The, this to me bridges into the awareness and into how to control a situation before the fists start flying. But you influence how that exchange starts to go and to do it in a, in a tactile drill, not just in a lecture. I think you're right, Trish. I think you're onto something. I, I, that definitely mirrors my experience because we have an almost identical drill. A proxim, you know, it's a my eye drill in Aikido, right? It's a right. Proximity drill anywhere else. Um, but are you guys familiar with Burton Richardson at all from the JKD world? At no, all? I'm not, not heard. Go, of go look him up. Um, I just, uh, I'm going through his knife material. Okay. And I, I am in no way affiliated with him. I'm a huge fan of it, but Aikido people need that knife material. It is the revamp of Tonto Dory, in my opinion. Right. Um, I, I don't want to spoil it, but it, it plugs into the Aikido syllabus so well. Um, but one of his initial drills is, uh, he, he said, you know, when he was doing his uh, jujitsu or his kickboxing, they'd want to introduce knife, but it was super awkward because people had gloves on or uh, if you were wearing a gi, maybe it was awkward to pull the knife. So he realized like, you don't need a training knife. You don't even have to carry one. What you do is while you're kickboxing or while you're doing your, your rolling and jujitsu, one partner will just reach for the belt line and that's your cue. Like, so what happens is you had to be super aware of where the hands were. Mm -hmm. And then uh, when you teach the self-defense stuff, you know, we'd be like at a proper my eye and, you know, my fence is up. We're having a, a conversation, you know, the, again, horrible. We're both horribly role playing a conversation. But at some point, one of those horrible role players will reach for their belt. So now you've got, okay, do I, do I arimi? Do I close the distance? Or do I use my escape skills and jet out? Um, so I think you're right. Like you're starting to build in the idea that awareness is even important. The awareness is even a thing that you need to be paying attention to. And I think if we're clever, maybe you're right. We can start covering more than we think we could if if we figure out where those uh those lines intersect and one thing i wanted to say uh when you brought this up is uh regarding the role playing there is no really such thing as as good role playing there's like acceptable role playing at best and i've trained with police officers and stuff who've done a lot of role playing there's always a a false veneer because you know you're not going to get hurt you know that they're trying to play a role, but they're not dressed for it. They're not Academy Award winning actors. The environment is false because you know in a dojo that is a safe place, for example. Um, and it, this is where, you know, I'm not, I'm personally not a huge fan of the, the, the role playing part. I'll, I will dabble in it a bit to give people the, the feel of the intensity of, of a real aggressive attacker. And I'm I, not to toot my horn, but I think I'm pretty good at it. But still, there's a falsehood where a student knows that when I do that, mm -hmm. I'm not doing it for real where I'm going to mm -hmm. kill them. We just can't. There's no way to, to simulate that. So, but the perfect can't be the enemy of the good where we, we keep with sterile practice because we can't add the physical intensity that would be there. We certainly can um, without needing to be, uh, to be full on actors with, with our, our verbals. You know, but it, verbals are like everything else. It mm -hmm. does pay to practice them. Hey, stay away from me. Get away. Have something that is comfortable that you can respond with, uh, not only with the hands, but of what comes out of your mouth. I don't so, want to, I don't want any trouble. I don't want to fight. So Dan, I know you're a conflict communication instructor under Rory Miller, right? Yeah. How do you train that stuff without giving away any like company secrets? Like what? How, no, no, no. It's so okay th that's a really good good question because with that that's one of the issues that i have with a lot of like when people talk self-protection is they think that talking about it is enough and you don't have to practice and it's skills like everything else you do have to practice the big advantage with things like verbals is that you can practice them in your daily life right so there's mm -hmm. kind of is um i'm going to do just one little bit of shameless self-promotion which is if you there's a free article on my patreon you can anyone can read it you don't have to join about different ways that we practice soft skills like what you learn in the dojo out the dojo that might be interesting so that's a general model is that your harm and harmony website? yeah yeah exactly okay but so that was that was my one bit of shameless self-promotion but uh, specifically for verbals i think there's one bit where you can drill it in class and again like you said the role-playing 
it's always a bit false and especially if like if it's not you know it's maybe a little better if it's like police officers and they run into the same situation all the time like you were saying but if we just do it in the dojo best to keep it simple you know, a simple thing you can do, a boundary setting drill where someone is walking towards you, you ask them to stay away, stay away. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. That's really important because sometimes you get people who are just like, you know, you, just running the drill where it always goes physical. And it's like, great, what you're teaching people is that verbals don't work, fantastic. Mm -hmm. Right. Like, that, that you don't want to do that. So you need to do a thing with both. And I, I like the main thing is not to make it too complicated. Don't try to come up with some elaborate storylines or you know, try to throw inches and just keep it really simple. Um, but like, th th you do have to do the education bit first. So people do need to do, oh, know, you know, what does a boundary setting, what does a boundary look like? How do you set it? Um, what does de-escalation look like? And then you can just do some very basic practice in class. But I think most importantly for these kinds of skills is people do have to use it in their life. Like yeah. you do have, you talk to people every day. It's, it's as simple as when someone offers you samples in the supermarket, actually look at them and say, no, thank you. Instead of ignoring them or someone is trying to sell you a magazine on the street, you know, um, actually be nice to people. If that's what you want to practice, actually be assertive, like just working on these things in your daily life. It, it's like any type of movement that you do is, you know, if you only ever do your footwork as like a static drill that you do in class, it's far less likely to come out when you need it then if you actually use that same footwork when you walk around during the day and when you're moving and when you're going about your business it's the same with these soft skills like you, verbal skills and all the others are things that are wonderfully suited to practice outside of class as opposed to you know fighting skills which you kind of get into trouble for if you do that right yeah. so um part of it is you you have to just actually go and do it you know, and the other thing that you can, of course, do is like this. This is one that I quite like is um, because we usually crap at telling how we actually come across, like take your laptop, take your phone, turn on the front facing camera, say the thing you want to say, record yourself and then look at it and see how you actually come across. You know, you're not trying to get it right. You're just trying to see what it's like, trying to try maybe different versions, facial expressions, that sort of thing. I've got one more for you guys, one more recommendation. I think both you guys need to check out if you haven't already, which, which you, you may have. Uh, Never Split the Difference by Chris Voss. Mm, yes. Right. But that, that made me think of that, Dan, because, I mean, that's his, now that you mention it, that's his recommendation. Just practice oh. the skills when you're out. You know, you're, it's a negotiation book, but, you know, we're always negotiating. Yeah. So there's always opportunity to practice those things. So I, I think you're right. That's That's probably the way to, to approach that you know that's one like of, down on my reading list so it's perfect recommendation sure. fantastic. fantastic one of uh one of the things as i did more of my study years ago on on body language and pre-fight cues and and some of the things that come up with uh that happen that you should be on the lookout for this really came into to the skill of to me at least of being a good uke if I could portray the body language signals that we should be looking for and then be able to, to show them and illustrate them, like not only from a, from a teacher's perspective, but if I'm working with somebody, I want to, I want to show them what, you know, a hard stare is or what shifty eyes are, or, you know, sneaking my hand back to the belt. Like you were talking mm -hmm. about that reach. Uh, it's one thing to do it in this big character uh, characteristic way that's that's easy for Nage to notice while we're practicing. But what happens when it's subtle or and it's you know understated? It's trying to be hidden. Um, so I I tried to explore that and bring at least a little flavor of role playing in, so that I could describe, for example, when somebody puffs up their chest, you know they they want to try to intimidate you, and then when they they shift back, like they they put a foot back, they start blading that's when the intimidation stops and that's when they're setting up to start to go physical. Like you need to notice these things. And so uh, it, it was an interesting path to try to try to bring that to my own UK skills so that I could, when I was training with somebody, show that to them, get them used to seeing what, and what that feels like uh, rather than, than to have, you know, the attacks merely be a, uh, a strict choreography and, and what happens in the setup before the the grab or before the punch or as the approach comes in and what i noticed as i started studying videos is this the the 
people that were in these videos were also not very good actors. If they were agitated and they approached somebody, you could spot body language mm -hmm. across the room of what was about to happen. And, and you didn't need to be a professional bouncer to work in a club for years in order to spot there's something wrong with the way they're walking, the way they're holding their, their body, uh, the way they're standing, the way they're, what they're doing with their eyes, you know, are they looking around or are they not looking around? Um, these things start to stand out. Now, granted, I don't do a ton of this in, in class, but it's something that like Dan was mentioning, I will bring up for a few minutes periodically through a class. Like if you see somebody come walking over to you and, you know, something doesn't feel right, realize, you know, that chest front means that they are probably agitated. And so this is, you can start to get some handle on maybe how you would decide to, to de-escalate that don't go chest to chest with them, which is very common. I call it mirroring, where you start to mirror the behavior of somebody else. If they get agitated, you get agitated. If they get ag aggressive or, or provocative, you get provocative or you rise to their level of energy. Um, but a lot of these things are things that can be practiced, at least when you're around other people to some degree, even subtly. And, and I had a, a friend of mine is a, poli a police officer a long time. He would never let himself be right in front of somebody. And he was really subtle about how he would do it. But if you walked over and talked to him, even if he was, you know, a good friend of yours, he would always shift a little bit to the side. So you were almost shoulder to shoulder kind of angled rather than front to front, just because it was like a habit. And this is something I wanted to, to bring up with this in terms of the self-protection, um, which is how you practice it normally. You wouldn't do it necessarily just waiting for somebody who's aggressive to come into your realm you always want to position yourself in such a way that it's not easy to get to you that you're in a somewhat you kind of have that awareness of your position and of what's going on around you all the time not to be that you're like super ninja guy who's paranoid about every living thing uh in, in their environment, but you have an awareness. You're not stuck on your cell phone where you have no awareness whatsoever. Uh, these are things that can be practiced all the time. Um, you know, and of course you hear people like retired military that will say, uh, or police officers say, every time I go into a room, I count, I know where the exits are. Uh, I always position myself back against the wall. I'll never have my back to a door, to a kitchen, to somewhere where I can't see. I always want to see the doors so that I know who's coming into the room so I can eye them up. There gets to be a level of, of awareness that becomes uh, very difficult to maintain, uh, not just logistically difficult, but emotionally difficult. You, you could even say it gets into PTSD. Um, I know a, a retired police officer uh, many years ago, every time he would come home, he would, he would take out his revolver and he'd sweep the house every single spot in that house that a human being could fit in, he would check visually before he could relax. Um, it's, you, you can take the, the art of self-protection and, and awareness to a, to a very high point where it can be very difficult to live with. Um, and it's up to each of us to find where that balance should be. But I think somewhere beyond not paying attention to anything, it's gotta be better than that. Um, I think for most of us, I, I, you know, I can't speak for every, every human on the planet. I think for most of us, the idea of self-protection is meant to be a quality of life enhancer. And if it ever is not, if it's the scale has been tipped, and then the idea of protecting yourself has now started to harm your quality of life, I, I think it could be there could be some room for pause and some some evaluation. It's sure. the same thing in martial arts. You know, when we go, all right. 99% of the people have gotten into martial arts because they have some fear of being hurt. And then you, and then they wind up at a dojo or a gym where the chance of them getting hurt are like 99%, you know, like, and somehow that's supposed to fulfill that self-defense requirement, you know, but, but we've just, we've lost that, that uh, perspective. We've lost that, that balance. So all of this stuff is meant to enhance our quality of life, not damage it. Mm -hmm. So that's just something to be to be aware of, like you said, I think. Yeah, and one thing with these skills, which is wonderful, is that a lot of them have, you know, the same way that training martial arts makes you can make you physically healthier and fitter and improve how you feel in your body. A lot of this can 
help with mental health and well-being. Awareness skills doesn't mean you just look for the bad guys. It means you notice the good stuff too. You know, one of the ways I notice that my awareness is getting better is when I get better at pointing out nice flowers to my wife when we're taking walking the dog in the spring, you know, because I notice them first because it, it's... I think that like, I, I don't do it. I barely do any of that stuff with you. I'm not sitting like with my back to the door or anything because like I live in a pretty safe area and I haven't pissed off anyone enough that they want to kill me, I think. So there's a pretty low risk. So I, I have a pretty low risk lifestyle. So I make sure I, I'm roughly aware of what's going on around me, you know, and some of that includes because of training, because of deliberately working on it noticing things that are potential problems people whose body language is off etc etc you know but it's not you don't have to just pay attention to that stuff you can pay attention to the good stuff verbal skills almost any job that you have and any lifestyle that you live having better people skills will help you it's it's a good thing it's not just about de-escalating people or you know the way that some people go on about it making sure that you say the right things before you hit the guy it's like mm -hmm. the point is not to hit the guy and also the point is these skills can make your life overall better and i think by thinking about it that way first it makes it easier to actually practice them in daily life like we talked about and secondly it means that you don't start to just see the bad stuff everywhere because everyone who trains this stuff goes through a phase where it's like, oh, this guy's leaning against the wall over there. I wonder if he's a mugger. And this, every, everyone I know who's had this training at some point has a phase where they're like seeing bad guys everywhere, right? But it's, it's you get past that. You yeah. do. What's, yeah. what's beautiful every, about what Dan just said mm -hmm. is, you know, if we're talking about it in a modern context, the idea of situational awareness and people skills and things like that, it, you just, you tilt this way and you're looking at a classical martial arts model, right? It's mindfulness and it's like what, uh, Tristan, what you and I have had conversation before, Shoto Seisu or to control the first move. It's, it's, uh, it's being present and mindful enough to have some effect on your external environment, right? And because we come from a classical martial art, we can talk about it like we're, you know, samurai or, you know, the modern take on it is a, a more of a tactical bent to it, you know, but it's like, we're finding these same things over and over and over again, you know? You know, one of the things as I look at, at whatever it is I want to pursue, I look at what, where's the top end? Like who are the people that are, that have really mastered these things. And I would say in the modern world, I have the a great respect for uh, bouncers and, and doormen and people that provide security in those high risk environments and police officers too, but they have a, they have a bit of a different, uh, experience. The, the bouncer is more like what I would probably have to deal with somebody in my home. I'm in a place, uh, and I need to cool things down and, and achieve peace. Police are kind of doing a little different job generally. Um, and what I found at the top end, the people that are extraordinarily competent, they are not the super paranoid ninja guys. The, they do not exude a, an air of, of anxiety or of, of uh, twitchiness or paranoia, anything like that. But they are always vigilant. They, are, they, they kind of exude a, a cool um, attitude. They know how to deal with, they know their profession. They know what they're capable of. Um, you know, they're observant, they, they know the value of, of seeing and understanding, getting a feel for the room and feel for what's happening, a feel for what somebody, you know, they call it profiling. And I know the, the word profiling has got kind of a bad rap, but they will eye somebody up in a second and say, is this person going to be a problem in my club or not? And they they use their instincts just like the, you know, the, the point before, um, but with ex enough experience, your instincts get really well honed. You can spot trouble a long time before it happens, most often, not always, but a, a large percentage of the time. And, but you don't have to look like you're a paranoid nut job either. Uh, and I think that goes for any civilian, any normal person. You can have those observation skills, get a feel for the room that you're in, get a feel for the people that are there. You know, if everything's cool, you go on about your business. You don't have to, you know, be peering around every corner expecting an ambush. Um, so 
I think that these are skills that are that are very accessible. Um, and I, I give great credit to the people like Rory Miller and Mark McYoung, a lot of the, those authors that have brought some exposure to what it's like to be among uh, or in an environment that has potential threats to it uh, or so, within it. So somebody new comes up to you outside of yourself. What's your what's your resource you recommend? Where do you where do you start? I don't know where to start. Where do I start? Uh, boy, that's I would I would say the the book that probably had the biggest impact to me was Rory Miller's Meditations on Violence. Um, that one stands as one of my favorites that I would recommend first, but The Gift of Fear by Gavin DeBecker. Uh, you know, Mark McYoung's got a great website with a lot of good articles on it. There's kind of a rabbit hole and you'll see that there are a number of, of authors that are connected uh, to him by association uh, that are excellent to, to read into. Um, it's colorful writing, uh, but very informative. Um, what about you, Dan? What do you think? What's your, well, I mean, I have to go with Rory as well, but everybody recommends Rory. So I'll, uh, some different ones, um, actually a different one from Rory, I think logic of violence, particularly the DVD, particularly if you're a martial artist, mm -hmm. that's the one that you should look at because it goes through the process of crime. Exactly. Like you were saying, you know, this design mm -hmm. of crime look at it from this point, Who, who's, who's um, material is that? That's Rory's. That is Rory's, okay. That is Rory's, yeah, that's a DVD okay. book. But so for other stuff, um, so Randy King, he's got a couple of online courses and some lots of stuff online. He's a really good resource. Um, there's a book called Creepology by Anna Valdiseri that's really useful for like low-level creeps. Um, not a problem for probably for any of us, I'm guessing, but you know, not all students fall in the same demographic. So definitely a um, problem if you have female students um, and very useful resource for that. Uh, the Little Black Book of Violence by Lawrence Kane and Chris Wilder is a really that is good. A great so book. That, that along with meditations would be like my second kind of book recommendation. Uh, there's a bunch of others, but I think these are like these are really good starting points. Mm -hmm. You know, I gotta go. I gotta go with meditations. I think too. Yeah. So if Rory, you're watching, Tristan and I recommend your book. Dan does not recommend your book. Right? <laughs> so. Oh man, don't say that. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely, it's the best one, but everybody recommends that one, right? And, and as you know, I was reading through these books, the, the thing that gets painted, uh, or the picture that got painted in my mind, uh, along with the live training that I was doing with, with uh, mentors that, that are from realms like that, is that you really cannot draw a, well, here's what violence is like. It's like this little thing. It, it has so many different expressions. Um, you know, a, a lot of, when you read Mark McYoung stuff, he talks about his, his uh past experience, which is a lot of seedy bars, bikers, kind of a, a lifestyle that, that most average people can't quite relate to. You can't think of violence in terms of, well, if it would work like there or in a prison, then it will work everywhere. There are so many different ways that violence comes to you that, that, that or that potentially may come to you. You can't just draw it in that little box and say, well, as long as I'm not in a gang fight or, or something like that, then, you know, or I want my skills to be able to apply there, which is different than, you know, for example, like a date rape situation or, you know, any other, any other type of a, of a thing. And, and it's easy to, to, for people that don't have firsthand experience with violence. And I would say by and large, I would, I would count myself among those. Even though I have worked some security, I've seen fights, I've have had some that I've been involved in, I've de-escalated many more than I've ever been in. But it's, it's easy to just say that uh, violence is like just a little, it's a mugging or it's a bar fight. Those are the two like broad brush stroke caricatures that are used. And yes, they both, those, both of those happen, but a lot of times intrusions upon your safety come in, in unpredictable forms um, and, and at un unpredictable times. Um, it's, that takes a while to really understand. And so it, to be on the watch for it all the time, and it might even be, it's not directed at you. It might be you come across somebody getting victimized by another person. So you're a third party in, in, in this and you then we get down the philosophical rabbit hole of do you help intercede on behalf of a, of a potential victim or not 
and we could have a whole show on that one <laughs> on that subject um, i think that's a really important point because when you're you know we're talking about nowadays it's easy to find good information but i think when you are seeking out this information it's worth taking a couple of minutes to look into who the author is and where they're coming from mm -hmm. because there are some things and then you know as you learn more and you get things from different authors with different backgrounds, you start being able to contextualize a little bit more what is relevant for you and what's not. Like the, the first book I read that uh, kind of got me into the, or maybe what we do in martial arts doesn't quite match for self-defense was uh, Jeff Thompson's Dead or Alive, mm, yeah. which, is, which was really interesting. But having read a bunch of other stuff, looking into it, there's some information in there that is fairly specific to his background. There's some, that's, some stuff that's incredibly useful there's some stuff where I'm like, this is really good, but I don't have that lifestyle that doesn't really apply to me. And I think that's, that's an important thing to know when you're reading someone's work. Also, I find that the more they, they draw attention to it, generally the better the information is. Like the more someone says, this is all I know about violence based on my experience. Um, generally, it's not as good as the people who say, well, I've done this little thing. And based on that, you know, and what you were saying as well, like as instructors, we kind of have to be honest where we're coming from. Mm -hmm. I, I tell all my students, I have very little actual experience. Most of my knowledge is just that it's training and knowledge. And you can do absolutely everything I'd have to do. Now, you'd have to read a lot and travel all over the world and train and do all sorts of stuff. You know, but you could do everything. I haven't done anything special and you need to know where this information is coming from. And if any of it doesn't match your experience or sounds like bullshit, you might want to listen to your own experience. Right. Dan, I think you really hit on some, I mean, it's kind of an epiphany for me, but, uh, it, but it's so obvious, like most epiphany, I guess. The most important part of self-protection is self, right? Like it's got, it's got to work for you. It's got to be. So I, I know I'm as guilty of that as anyone is going like, well, this guy over here was a Navy SEAL, you know, and this, and, and that's what he said, but I'm not, you know, like, so how is that helpful? Uh, and some of it will be, and then, and then a lot of it might not be. So I think that's really important, especially as an instructor, is that we meet our students where they're at mm -hmm. and go, like, well, tell me about yourself. Like, what do you, what do you do? Like, wh where are you? Where do you live? You know, um, so that when we're putting together solutions that we're actually addressing their problems and not here just this this book do everything in this book and you'll be you'll be okay uh, and that's that and i'm glad you brought that point up because this brings us back kind of the beginning of our conversation which is you know people are often drawn into oh i want to learn from a navy seal because those guys are badasses or in the point that you made dan the person that came to mind who i admire a great deal is uh lee morrison and his urban combative stuff and you can go on on youtube and check a bunch of it out this is a hardcore dude that clearly got into a lot of bar fights because I would not want to met. He was like a, a you know, a very powerful martial artist, but I would count what he does sort of in the, that Krav Maga category of extremely high level of physical harm that he delivers very, very quickly. Tremendous. But just like the Navy SEAL, is that what, somebody is going to need for their self-defense or self-protection skills maybe but maybe not uh you know it looks to me like morrison probably uh, similar to mark mcyoung probably came up in a very rough part of town hung out with some very seedy people that would tend to fight on a regular basis and he got pretty good at it um but again is that something where the tra training like that would be hardcore enough where the average person would say, boy, this is pretty ugly. I don't really want to get this deep. Um, or the Navy SEAL. And, and this is where a military hand-to-hand -hand violence solution may not fit the civilian world terribly well, which is, you know, and the military is unashamed of saying we will deliver the maximum amount of of harm and damage as quickly as possible to obtain complete submission. That's, that's what it is. You know, unfortunately that doesn't translate well into the civilian world where, uh, you know, there's, there are some problems with, with that approach. Even the Romans knew you couldn't bring soldiers, train soldiers back into the city 
because they would cause problems. They were so aggressive with what they were trained to do. And I'm, and I think things are a little bit different now with, with modern military, they're not put onto that psychological edge, but there's still a factor of what they were trained to do is not so much a civilian application, like in a, in a city or, or in civilized society. Um, in addition, you know, how many people are willing to go through the level of intense training that a Navy SEAL goes through? I mean, even among military people, there aren't very many that, that can hold up to that. Um, it's an impressive achievement, no doubt. Um, you know, or even look at the, you know, Marine Corps uh, martial arts or the, uh, what is it, the, there's an acronym for it. Very potent martial art, very damaging. Uh, you know, it's, it's intense. It also takes a pretty solid physical fit level of physicality and athleticism to do it, um, which I think all martial arts do take physicality uh, in order to perform them. But, you know, it's what, what people want to learn, not only to solve the issue they may have, uh, but what they're willing to put their body through to do it. Like these are facts. I think there's, well. there's also a, a like physical and psychological baseline, as you, you said about the physical, but like, you know, something that works when you're training exclusively young, extremely fit men who are at least comfortable enough with violence to have voluntarily joined a military force mm -hmm. might not be, it might not be the system that, that, that might not be as effective when you have a group of varied physicalities. And there's psychological factors, because particularly when we're talking self-protection, you know, there are people who show up to the dojo, all you have to do is give them a set of physical techniques, they learn and they're fine. Mm -hmm. But there are people who show up for whom even the idea that I'm worth defending is, is a, a goal. Like that's something they have to get to. That's not a starting point. And especially like, I, I think I might've mentioned this last time, but the reason that I like Aikido as a system where we also teach self-protection is because people who will not go to something that is advertised as like hardcore, you know, combatives, craft jutsu type stuff, um, are more likely to throw up and they're actually the ones who are more likely to need the self-protection skills. Mm -hmm. So I think that, that you know, you, you do, and on the other hand, you look at military stuff and it's stuff that works with relatively little training time because they have so many other things they need to be trained. Mm -hmm. Right. Hand to hand. So there's good stuff there too. It's not, mm -hmm. you know, but oh, yeah. you Very much so. have to contextualize it and figure out which parts of that are useful. I have a friend who teaches, um, he teaches historic martial arts, but they use World War II combatives as their warm-up. So they also get a pretty solid, you know, um, pretty solid hand-to-hand uh, -hand training in that. Uh, the other training is weapons. So if you can find a way to make it work, you know, it's great. So Dan, I think, and this is Aikido specific, but we're Aikidoka, so I think we can we can do this. Uh, we, <clears throat> I think that's a good call to action to Aikido instructors. That if you say that your Aikido has a, a self-defense component, or if you say, the Aikido will make you safer. Then I think we have a responsibility to make sure we're covering these soft skills the best that we can and not just go like Tristan started saying, like, we can't just say, well, don't worry, do your Aikido. But if you really want to defend yourself, do X, you know, get, get your firearm or just run away or just, you know, any of the justs, right? Dan? Just, yeah. um, but if you say at all, that it has a self-defense component to it. We do have a responsibility for those soft skills because you're right. We're going to be getting the audience that might not gravitate toward a, a highly um, physically aggressive martial art. So we've got to provide them with real tools. Right. And so the solution I don't think is just, well, let's just do really tough Aikido and make them, make them tough. No, it's got to be like, how do we, how do we do risk assessment? How do we set boundaries? How do we, um, de-escalate uh, verbal confrontation. How are you comfortable in a verbal confrontation? You know, I think those things we really owe it to our students to get good at if we are telling them that it will help them be safer. If that's of no interest to you, cool. Just say this is like a cultural dance. This is a, a, a cultural study. Um, it's, it's fun. You know, you get to roll around, you'll, you'll work up a sweat, you know, after an hour of getting thrown around. If that's all you need it to be, that's, I have no beef with that. There's no problem. But if there's any element of self-protection in there, then uh, I think soft skills needs to be a, a primary focus of ours then. You know, I, I've seen in many arts where they'll talk about, you know, footwork. Footwork's important. 
and students will hear, oh yeah, okay, all right, I buy that. But they won't actually go through and say, here's how to do footwork. Here's, here's what you must be doing. And here, here are bad habits you want to avoid. But they'll just say, yeah, footwork's crucial. Absolutely important. Well, don't let it be just a cliche. And I, I like how you put that, Oliver, about, you know, if you're going to make the claim, back it up and have ways to convey those things and teach them and not just let it be a cliche. I, I get, I like good sayings, but I hate it when they, they're, the cliches are like bumper sticker philosophy. You know, you have to under, understand what's underlying with it. And, and I think if, if somebody got into this, they would start to see how, I, for example, with Aikido, how everything that we do does interlace with those protection skills very well. And that if there was any art that, that feathered in there, it would be Aikido into how do I, how do I solve this problem with the least amount of, of exertion or the least amount of energy or, or force? Because I'd like to solve this problem elegantly and not just, you know, blast my, uh, this potential threat, you know, out of their socks, which is, does bring up moral problems as well as, you know, tactical, logistical issues too. Yeah, you actually have to be able to do it. Mm -hmm. Right. And if you can't, now we got, we need some other tools possibly. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Exactly. And that's one thing that you said that I think is really good because you said, you know, we owe it to our students to get good at this stuff. Because I think too many instructors, maybe, you know, you get used to being an instructor and you decide you want to do self-defense. But so you think, okay, I, I just like, I got to get this information as quickly as possible and teach it as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, before you can teach it, you have to learn it. Like you have to actually get good at it. So one guideline is like, don't make students do drills you haven't done yourself, you know, for the soft skills as well. Like do the stuff that, you know, actually get decently good at these skills, stay within your scope of practice, mm -hmm. right? Martial arts instructors mm -hmm. are not psychiatrists. For example, you know, there, there is stuff that, and the ones um, that aren't Dan aren't, I, I'm Dan not, actually, I'm not, okay. like, I, I, I am not, I have a one year master's in the research that goes with counseling. I, I'm not a counselor. So okay. I really want to say that up front. Like I have a better understanding than a lot of people, but it's limited. You know, there, there is some, like you, you have to stay with these corporates. And the other thing is that if you want your students to have access to these skills, but you can't provide it, get comfortable referring. Mm -hmm. Like bring someone in for a seminar once a year. You know, when I was uh, training in Aikido in Scotland, we, we Rory would come in once a year. Now the, the club that they bring me over once a year to do self-defense for them because they do Aikido, which maybe has some self-defense components, but they're not covering everything, you know, or for someone who's looking for that, if you don't provide that, find the best school in your area that does and get okay with telling them this might not be what you're looking for. Mm -hmm. You know, get comfortable referring people because it's it's not about you; it's about them and what they need. You know, so yeah. Anyway, sorry, it's little soapbox there. It's just I'm I'm think it's really important that people know what they're getting when they get into training. Excellent point. Well, we're right about ninety minutes, so I'll I'll uh, put it to you both to uh, have a wrap up with some finishing thoughts. Anything you want to um, add on? Uh, that was a, a pretty comprehensive uh, introduction because <laughs> as we know, like there's so much. This. Um, yeah. I, I think, you know, Tristan said it best. You have to take responsibility. No one's going to, to download this information to you. Like you have to seek it. You got to be uh, hungry for it. And I'm kind of talking to my fellow martial arts instructors right now, because I, I am a big believer that, you know, we're here for our students. So the better that we are, it's not for us. It's so that our students can, can reap the benefits of that. And again, if you are telling them even a little bit that being here is um, a benefit to your self-protection, you have to give them real tools. And I'm not talking about like combatives. I mean, the other, the other portions of it that are often uh, neglected. So that would be my, my, my big call to action to our fellow instructors is, is get good at the stuff, not for your sake, but for your students' sake. And, and in doing so, the sake of the art. If, Absolutely. If instructors started doing that, by and large, I think Aikido would have an entirely different reputation. And, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Dan, your thoughts? Well, and one thing that specifically on what you just said with the Aikido, I mean, I think it's great that there are people who are focusing on the historical preservation with any art, because I think that that's important. That's a whole other conversation. Mm -hmm. But... Um, 
what I say is that if you look at most martial arts, and Aikido is no exception, a lot of these issues are hinted at in there, right? Mm -hmm. they're, they're included in some ways, like what you were saying earlier with the, you know, not following people for pins, for example, in my style, there's a big difference uh, between how you respond after a throw and after a pin, and there's generally getting distance after the throws. And if you do a lock, you go into a pin, there's a difference there. But the thing is, these issues are hinted at, and that is good, that gives you clues for what to explore. It's not enough. Like just because it's abstractly hinted at in the art doesn't give you the skills. It, it helps you and it gives you a way to internalize them and it gives you places to explore. They're in there, but if you really want to go into self-protection, you have to do more. The one other point that I want to make is in something you said earlier, which is with the sayings, right? Sayings are cool. Mm -hmm. Just because you look into self-protection doesn't mean we get immune to that. Because there's so many, there's the same thing in self-protection where people read something a cool instructor, like one of the people that we mentioned earlier say, and they just repeat that without really understanding. If you look at Tristan in, in the Aikido groups on Facebook, you know, any post on knife defense, what is the phrase that people repeat over and over? You will get cut in a knife fight. Like most of them, clearly they've read that somewhere. You know, I know several instructors who have good knife defense programs and experience who say that that's not a good mindset to go into. You know, this is there's nuance to it, but people in this like the self protection field isn't different in that aspect in martial arts. All the stuff you find in martial arts, you find there too. So working on that mindset as well of contextualizing information and trying to get nuanced understanding is one of the best things that you can do for yourself and your students. Absolutely. Well, thank you guys. This has been a great discussion. I, I uh, lived up to every expectation and and certainly more than that. So, guys, uh, thank you. That was awesome. Thank you yep. very much. This has been a lot of fun. Thank you, guys. Have a great, great evening. You too, man. Thank you very much for listening, and I hope you enjoyed this discussion. Stay tuned for more episodes. I've got some great stuff on the way very soon. In the meantime, enjoy your training.